Welcome to My Security TV. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the executive editor and director for My Security Media. Uh, and welcome to another episode of Tech and Sec Weekly. Uh, today's episode, we're going to be joined by uh, Srini Batroli, uh, the head of advanced consulting service Nokia Software. We're going to be looking at APAC cybersecurity strategies, particularly Singapore and uh, Canada. Uh, but we'll have a walk through those, particularly given that we've been looking at the Australian cybersecurity strategy as well for a few episodes. Uh, so looking forward to that. And uh, with uh, with Srini, uh, he's based in Singapore. And then we're going to cross over to Dan Ironreich in Israel and looking at uh, industrial control systems, cybersecurity incidents of the past decade and more, and uh, including 2020, uh, particularly some of those that uh, occurred uh, in the Middle East this year. Uh, and Daniel's with Secure Communications and Control Experts. So let me just walk through these slides as, as we normally do, just gonna let you know what we're doing uh, this week uh, and then also what we've got coming up uh, on the series. Uh, as of Friday, and this is now out as a podcast, but you've also, you can also uh, watch this episode uh, on MySec TV, Government Ministerial Reshuffle to Include Cybersecurity. And that's obviously with the Australian government uh, finally uh, putting cybersecurity back at a ministerial level. So thank you to Claire Pales, Abbas Kudrati, uh, and Nick Savides for that very uh, insightful discussion. It goes for about 35 or 40 minutes uh, and worth having a listen to as well. Uh, while I'm here, uh, we do welcome, uh, if you're listening uh, or tuning in, uh, if you can click like, I think, and lets us know that you're, you're here, uh, but otherwise, uh, welcome to take questions during this particular session uh, as well. Uh, I just dropped uh, this session with uh, Dr. Chris Flaherty. We looked at war lasers. He did a, well, it was more, uh, wrote, wrote a recent paper on uh, laser technology and uh, the military applications and then also the potential uh, uh, sort of convergence of these into uh, weapons, uh, civil uh, built weapons uh, as well. So that the title of his paper, The War Laser, New Terrestrial Service Battlefield Geometry, worth having a look at. And the more you actually look at laser technology in military applications, everyone's doing it. Israel's doing it. The UK just announced uh, in their um, recent uh, budget increase, they're looking at lasers. Uh, Australia, US are looking at hypersonic weapons. Uh, the Russians have got them. So a very interesting uh, piece of technology and worth having a, a look at as well, right within our domain. Uh, tomorrow, we've got uh, the Dato Amarudin, the Chief Executive Officer with Cybersecurity Malaysia and the Senior Vice President International Business with HGC Global Communications, uh, Mr. Ravindran Malingam. Uh, we're looking at Malaysia's National Telecom Cybersecurity and they signed an MOU uh, between HGC and Cybersecurity Malaysia. And we'll also have some announcements around our Women in Security uh, in Malaysia awards, which uh, are being scheduled for around 17th of December. Um, then on Thursday, uh, this is with Gregory Towhill and Shemaine Tan. Gregory is the former CISO of Pres President uh, Barack Obama, so he'll be tuning in from the US. Uh, this is at midday uh, Australian Eastern Standard Time. So this is part of the Blackout series. It's episode two, Leadership in Crisis Times, uh, and uh, that's been supported with Recorded Future. So worth having a look at. Uh, and again, we'll be there uh, with Shemaine uh, on her Cyberis Meetup. So uh, cyberismeetup.com, uh, or it's on the marketplace if you wanted to tune in. Uh, Active Directory Security uh, on Monday, and these are gonna be seeing live demo uh, attacks with Alcid, uh, Ben Moody, and Kevin Tran from Spider Labs, which is a TrustWave company uh, and a Singtel company. Um, we're going to be looking at Active Directory, how it's used, uh, why it's so important, uh, the Active Directory threat landscape, uh, and also the relationship between Active Directory and ransomware, uh, the, that relationship, and also those common vulnerabilities. Uh, we are getting a, quite a strong audience in for that, uh, so it's worth tuning in, and you do have to register uh, again, if you go to mysec.tv, uh, that session is available to, to tune in on. Uh, and just finally, on our podcasts, uh, these MySec TV episodes are being tuned into the podcast, the Cybersecurity Weekly Podcast. 
So whatever your preference is, either on uh, YouTube uh, or your podcast uh, select, uh, you can tune into these. Uh, and then we're cutting them down. So just this week, uh, we released CyberArk with Thomas Fickenshire, the regional director for ANZ, looking at the identity is the new perimeter. Uh, Doc Watson, uh, the Australian Cyber Defence, um, big pun, Australian Defence Force Cyber Skills Challenge 2020, uh, and that episode. And I'm very pleased every time I listen to it, it's got an F-35 flyover. So uh, worth having a listen just for that. Uh, and again, the panel session is now on the podcast uh, also. Um, and I'm just waiting on final uh, go ahead on the milestone interview from their experience centre in Melbourne. And uh, very interesting session again with that, looking at uh, the COVID-19 and video management system software uh, and how the two are coming together. So uh, that should be out very shortly. Uh, and I just got word uh, 20 minutes ago, we're doing an interview on Friday with Certus uh, Security in Singapore. And there, um, I can't find the, the notes, basically uh, security applications and robotics uh, with Certus. They, uh, I was in Certus uh, headquarters in Singapore uh, last year during Interpol World. So uh, it's good to catch up. Fuji Fu, their digital data officer, uh, their chief data officer, uh, will be joining us on Friday, which is great. Okay, then that, before I move over and bring in Srini, I just want to check up. We are, someone's listening. Thank you, Helen. Uh, appreciate that. And it's good to know that someone's listening out there. So uh, it's good to have you on. Okay, now let me bring uh, Srini in. Let me just swap over these two here. And Srini, let me get your name up there for, I don't know if I said it, I think I might have said it incorrectly, Bata Prolu, you must say it better than I do. Bata Prolu, yep. Beautiful. Okay, thank you, Srini. Um, Head of Advanced Consulting Service with Nokia. And um, we we had you on our Indo-Pacific series, I think, last time. And um, we're going to be looking at the APAC cybersecurity strategies. And I think it was the episode where we talked about the Australian cybersecurity strategy as well um, and some of your work. So I think maybe introduce yourself uh, to the audience, uh, just what your role is, and then we'll dive into, we're going to look at the Singapore cybersecurity strategy uh, first up. So yeah, just your role as uh, head of consulting. Yep, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, as as always, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, yeah, I am part of Nokia. I've been with Nokia for almost uh, three years now, and I head the uh, advanced consulting services, and security consulting happens to be a part of our portfolio. And uh, me and my team, we work a lot uh, in areas like 5G consulting, IoT security consulting, and 5G security, and cloud security consulting. So there, there are there's a lot of work that me and my team have actually done and then we do deliver consulting projects to our esteemed customers, whether it is communication service providers or, for that matter, even large enterprises. And so you are part of Nokia as a sort of a parent company? Yes, I'm part of Nokia software, uh, which is being rechristened as Cloud and Network Services. Uh, that's going to happen from the 1st of January. But as of today, I'm part of Nokia software. Got it. And we do, and, and you've just reminded me, we were talking about the 5G uh, technology during your last session. We will have that session in the show notes uh, as well. Um, I hope that background noise isn't coming in. Um, I'm obviously in the middle of Sydney, so I'm beeping their horn outside. Um, Trini, we've been covering the Australian Cybersecurity Centre in some detail, uh, including the head of the Australian Cybersecurity Centre. Just mentioned there, we had the panel session last Friday uh, looking at the ministerial sort of responsibilities that are getting introduced again with cybersecurity here in Australia. So it was something that we've had in sort of in the pipeline with a while for a while with you, uh, looking at regional cybersecurity strategies and how that might fit. Um, if you can introduce us to what your observations are there in Singapore at a national cybersecurity uh, sort of strategy level and, and what uh, those observations involve. Sure. So Cyber Security Agency of Singapore was formed in 2015. Uh, Singapore has been pretty much an active member of cyber security since 2005. 2009, they released their first report. And this is currently the, the, the Cyber Security Agency is part of uh, the Prime Minister's office. Uh, you can see the importance that Singapore is really attaching to cyber security as a, as a discipline. Wow. And this is currently being managed by the Ministry of Communication Information. 
Yeah. So if you if you look at the uh, cybersecurity strategy, it's it's a pretty detailed document. Elaborates quite a few areas. There are basically four key pillars. Uh, the first one is all about building resilient infrastructure, uh, creating a very safe cyberspace. Uh, the third one is about developing vibrant cybersecurity ecosystem. That's where the focus of uh, ecosystem comes into the play. Uh, last but not least, it's all about strengthening in, uh, strengthening the international partnerships. I think that's something which is very very important. Uh, these four pillars are pretty much present in any cybersecurity strategy report that you see. For example, Australia has released one in July 2020, if I'm not wrong. If you look at them, they also talk about uh, similar approaches, and so does uh, Canada, uh, which is obviously the, uh, the part of the Five Eyes community, right? Yeah. So these, these are basically the four key pillars. If you analyze the cyber, uh, the, the whole cybersecurity strategy, I think the focus is pretty much on critical infrastructure. Uh, Singapore calls it critical infrastructure information infrastructure. They have defined critical information infrastructure comprising of four specific sectors. Uh, the first one is obviously utilities, uh, telecom, water, uh, gas. So telecom is actually treated as a uh, under the uh, aegis of utilities there. Then they've got uh, transport. Uh, and I think the, the most important addition to this critical information infrastructure uh, in Singapore is the services sector. And they have actually alluded to financial services being one of their critical information infrastructure uh, component. So that's something which is very, very interesting. Uh, I have seen at least five or six cybersecurity strategy reports. People do talk about the importance of financial services, but they have, they have not been categorized as critical information infrastructure or critical infrastructure per se, right? So that's something which is, which is very, very clear from Singapore's uh, report. The second aspect which is very clear is uh, Singapore follows a very structured approach to towards assessing the readiness of the critical information infrastructure. They have something called a risk management index, and they actually insist on security by design. So this is something which is very important. Security by design is nothing but a best practice that ensures that the system is developed with security consideration from the beginning. So that's something which is very, very, very important. And uh, the other thing which is very, uh, very, uh, very clearly coming out from the Singapore cybersecurity uh, uh, strategy is they have actually strengthened their cybersecurity legislative uh, le legislation and governance frameworks, and they have actually put the onus of securing the critical information infrastructure let me call it cii for the sake of uh, uh, for the sake of ease going forward so securing cii the onus of it pretty much rests with the provider or the owner of uh, the uh, CII. So if a uh, telecom service provider is providing a service, the onus of securing it actually rests with the provider. So that's something which is very clear from the cybersecurity strategy report. Just, just on that, um, Srini, with the critical infrastructure, those that that what you just mentioned there requires consulting the uh, the auditing aspect as well, that risk audits as well. Was there any something that we saw in the Australian cybersecurity strategy is the sort of capability uplift. And now here in Australia, they're talking about the potential for national security, the Australian Cybersecurity Centre to come in over the top, uh, should a sort of critical infrastructure be attacked or under attack, that can come in and sort of take over those systems and defend, actively defend. Anything like that in the Singapore, any discussions around that in Singapore? Because I know that Singapore strategy does sort of focus on critical infrastructure and critical information infrastructure, but it uh, does maybe not go that far. No, in fact, a uh, very pertinent point. Actually, uh, Singapore uh, really talks about building cyber skills, uh, and then uh, it talks about the 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 uh, national uh, communication uh, plan, uh, where basically the national cyber cyber security plan. So that's something which is very important. In fact, there are three ways in which Singapore proposes to build capabilities. The first one is through an industry-oriented curriculum that they wanted to actually bring in uh, for the benefit of people who would like to. Uh, make 
an entry into the cybersecurity domain. Uh, they are actually offering scholarships and sponsorships for people who are actually interested in cybersecurity. And then through the skills future, they are actually offering upskill and reskill opportunities for people who would really want to get into the, uh, the cybersecurity space. They have invested uh, very heavily on uh, 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 the cyber response uh, uh, infrastructure. That's something which is there. What they also do is they conduct exercises. And I haven't really found this in any uh, cybersecurity report. They are, the government actually conducts the specific exercises to measure the robustness of the CII. So they, these are the exercises which are conducted both at the national level as well as at the sectoral level. So that's something which is actually being propagated by Singapore. And that is really going to test the resilience of these uh, critical information infrastructure. What, uh, what size budget does that strategy have? Was there any sort of monetary value put around it? Right. So uh, what Singapore talks about is uh, they, they are very clearly stating that they are actually going to spend 8% of their ICT budget on cybersecurity. So in some of the reports that I've read, they're talking about investing $200 million, Singapore dollars, uh, mind you, over the pa next five years. But what they're very clearly... <laughs> They have very clearly stated that they will spend 8% of their ICT budget very specifically on cybersecurity initiatives, and the uh, the cybersecurity strategy clearly outlines that. Okay. Um, just coming back to the minister, he said it's in the Prime Minister's office, is it? Is there yes. a, a specific minister? How, how is, what's the structure? So it is uh, it is currently managed by the Ministry of Communication and Information. So that's right. uh, who, he's the person who actually manages it. But then it, they report into the Prime Minister's office. That's how it is uh, structured. Okay. And what would you say the activity around the law enforcement capability has been as well? Again, here in Australia, there's a lot more focus on uh, sort of capability uplift here. And you mentioned the skills related. So they, I think they've got 500 jobs on. Uh, sort of on the mark over the next uh, decade uh, for the Australian Signals Directorate. Yep, yep. Very, very pertinent point. In fact, Singapore has a very stringent punitive measure. Uh, for example, the National Cybersecurity Action Plan actually has a very clear uh, judicial framework to make sure that uh, uh, from a law perspective, the cybersecurity incidents are covered. And the punitive measures that are imposed on convicts who are actually getting convicted through the cybersecurity law are extremely stringent and they are extremely uh, they, they are pretty extreme. So there is absolutely no allowance that is provided whatsoever to anybody who's found, uh, um, uh, who's found, who found who's convicted under the Singapore uh, cybersecurity law. So that's something which they are very much looking at. They're talking about sharing intelligence. They have actually got something called ASEAN Regional Forum, where they are actually uh, trying to foster uh, basically the cyber confidence building and then the cyber capacity building so they Singapore wants to take a leadership role through the ASEAN resource for, uh, uh, regional forum and they they are actually sharing intelligence and I'm sure uh, people who are actually joining this session are aware of different sessions that Singapore have uh, Singapore has and Singapore hosts uh, from the ministers of ASEAN and then the way kind of information sharing that happens in a multi-directional manner yeah I think Australia was leading the the either the APAC cert or the ASEAN cert at once. It wouldn't be no, it wouldn't be the ASEAN cert. But uh, again, I invite that to the audience. If you're aware of any regional groups that Singapore Australia uh, is working in, um, and we did have uh, Toby Fe uh, Feakin, Dr. Toby S. Feakin, uh, on the Australian ambassador for cyber and critical technology, uh, he's very active up there, um, and also doing quite a bit with uh, Indonesia uh, as well in this space. Let's move on to, to Canada. I think Canada and Australia are quite aligned, as you mentioned, the five eyes, but uh, sort of quite comparative Commonwealth uh, structures as well. How, uh, how sort of related does Canada look towards uh, Australia and Singapore? 
Right, great. So I think the first thing that we got to really look at is where does cyber security as a discipline come in, you know, under the federal structure of Canada, right? So uh, cyber security is part of uh, Ministry of National Defense in Canada. Um, um, and, and, and I think the second question comes uh, as to how much, uh, uh, among, how much money is Canada really willing to pledge for the sake of cyber security. In 2018, uh, Canada has presented to its uh, public that they would be spending 500 million over the next five years specifically on the cyber security initiatives. So that's something which is uh, which is very, very clear. And I think uh, uh, basically one aspect which Canada states very clearly and which comes out even in the Australian cyber security report as well is that they very clearly recognize that the threats to the critical infrastructure, again, the focus is on the critical infrastructure would come from outside of Canada. So that's something something that they have very boldly stated. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's something that they very boldly stated. And uh, instead of pillars, uh, Canada cybersecurity strategy has three pil uh, three themes. So they are they are calling it themes. You can call them themes, pillars, whatever you want to call them. The first one is all about security and resilience of govern uh, the government and private property. So that's something which they are talking about, and they have elaborated uh, this to a great extent. The second one is uh, uh, cyber innovation. This is where they are actually talking about. Uh, 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 supporting advanced research, uh, fostering digital innovation. That's something which is very clearly mentioned in the uh, Canadian Cybersecurity Strategy Report. The third one is all about leadership and collaboration. So that's something which is uh, which is very evident from uh, the Canadian Cybersecurity Strategy Report. And again, this is something which I want to bring uh, to, uh, to the notice of everybody, whether it is Australian Cybersecurity Strategy Report, whether it is Singapore, or for that matter, even Canada, all three of them recognize recognize that IoT, uh, Internet of Things, is going to be one of the most important development in the digital world. So they have very clearly spelled out rules and regulations. Australian uh, cybersecurity strategy talks about code of practices, so does uh, Singapore cybersecurity. Canada also talks about the code of practices around the Internet of Things, and it very clearly states that onus of ensuring security in IoT space pretty much rests with the provider of the IoT service. So that's something which is very, very striking from all the cybersecurity strategy reports that we've gone through. Any discussion around regulation of IoT from what you've been looking at? Uh, people don't talk about regulation per se. I think they are, what they are talking about is a code of practice and uh, there is assessment that's going to be done. For example, Singapore talks about the risk uh, maturity index. So people talk about assessments, people talk about code of practice and uh, making sure that the organizations pretty much confirm to the code of practices rather than speaking about explicit regulations. Um, yeah. while, while some people have, at, at least uh, some of the reports have certainly talked about explicit regulations, but I don't really see that very clearly spelled out in any of the cyber security strategy, strategy reports, Chris. It might be something, if you do see Srini, send us through the link and we'll add that because uh, Australia has just done, uh, they've got a similar code of practice, uh, a set of guidelines, I think, but I think it was set, of, set out as a code. Um, so, again, ministerial-wise, it's at National Security in Canada. And yeah. what's the structure around, say, law enforcement here in Australia? We've got the Australian Signals Directorate, which kind of heads it up uh, in part of defence. And then we've also got the Department of Home Affairs, which covers over Australian Federal Police and, and others and the other sort of law enforcement bodies. Is that similar to what you would see in Canada? So there is national defense, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier in my conversation, yeah. and under that there is public safety, under that there is cyber security. That's how the structure flows wow. within Canada. And obviously the, the signals directorate all are part of the public safety. So that's where, in fact, the cyber security strategy is actually signed by the uh, uh, public safety minister. Uh, so I don't, I think it's uh, Mr. Goodale. Uh, I don't remember the name. Uh, apologies if I, were to, if I mentioned it incorrectly, but I think that's what, that's what it is. Um, and do they? I take it they've got a national cybersecurity centre. If they've got something national like Australia, and then again through the states uh, with cybersecurity centres. 
Yes, yes. Uh, Canada actually talks a lot about establishing a national cybersecurity center. In fact, they've already done that. Uh, the other thing that they're talking about, the two other things that I would like to really mention, they're talking about actually incentivizing the STEM graduates, the science, technology, engineering, and medicine graduates to actively take up cybersecurity as a profession. In fact, they've mentioned a very important statistics in their uh, cybersecurity strategy report. They said today, cybersecurity security actually contributes close to 1.7 billion and it's actually creating close to 11,000 jobs to the uh, uh, 1.7 billion to the Canadian GDP and creates close to 11,000 jobs and they expect this to grow at a CAGR of 66 percent beyond 21 and 22 so that's something which is what they very clearly mentioned and they talked about uh, bringing in very specific punitive measures uh, although they are not as uh, as stringent as they are at least i didn't find them as stringent as they are in singapore yeah. but they are certainly talking about punitive measures and the other thing which is very very evident from the canadian cyber security strategy is their willingness to embrace new technologies like the artificial intelligence the machine learning and for that matter even blockchain for the public services for example they are already alluding to usage of uh, these advanced technologies for example blockchain for passports, blockchain for contracts and legal documents within the Canadian uh, public. So this is something which is being talked about and they pretty much say that this is going to be a reality very soon. And we all know that Singapore is already talking about these things. And I think for me, uh, for, uh, if you ask me personally, I believe that it's high time that countries really embrace these advanced technologies to make sure that they are able to secure their critical information infrastructure. And maybe just let's finish off with some other observations. We, you mentioned India uh, sort of pre-interview as well. Um, and we've mentioned we're talking to Malaysia at Cybersecurity tomorrow as well. We'll get a bit of an update uh, there. But India uh, at a national level, we just ran our India Reach series and our Indo-Pacific series. So we've got a pretty good insight into what India is doing and their sort of digital first strategy. Uh, as well. Um, any sort of recent news out of India in terms of cybersecurity and their strategy? Uh, they are, they are apps, uh, India, as uh, many might know, it's actually part of the Home Affairs. Department of Home yeah. Affairs actually handles uh, cyber security. So India is certainly coming up with a code of practice on cyber security, which sounds like music to my ears. So being an Indian, I think there is going to be a lot of focus that will be provided by cyber security. Again, India has very clearly recognized that their threat to the critical information infrastructure pretty much lies outside. So they are made, they made every possible possible effort and they are trying to make sure that they are testing the resilience and establishing the resilience of their critical information infrastructure. Uh, they have also started the digital first initiative and they've also start, uh, started talking about the uh, the smart cities. We've talked about 100 smart cities, which is, uh, which is one of the favorite pet projects of our Prime Minister Narendra Modi. So with that coming into the play, IoT security happens to be one of the most important aspects that the Indian government will focus on. And Although India is not running towards 5G per se, India cannot be left behind. So come 2022, we believe that the, the cyber, uh, the 5G spectrum is going to be auctioned. And once uh, the, the 5G services are going to be considered, I think India will have to put a lot more effort and emphasis on the security. And 5G security happens to be one of the key things. So I, I, th I believe that uh, the cyber security loss will uh, come into the play in India. Although the code of practices have come in, the public consultation is going on as it happened in Australia, Canada, and Singapore in the past. I think India is going through the process. It won't be uh, it won't be far off before we see a clear cyber security strategy document coming out of the Indian government, especially the Department of Home Affairs. Do you, do you think five G and that sort of communication technology is driving all of this, despite all the sort of the, the known vulnerabilities um, and ransomware attacks and everything else that we are seeing, Beck fraud is another one that you know really need to get that awareness out there for enterprise. But from a national security perspective, 5G and IoT are sort of driving this, where they've got to get cybersecurity right before all of this gets rolled out. Is that kind of where the the um, it's a hard one? I, it's kind of one the technology, but two the geopolitics is also driving 
this because the, of the uptake in sort of national uh, and um, sort of motivated attacks as well. W what's your take on the link between 5G, IOT, IOT and cybersecurity and the drive for these national cybersecurity strategies? Well, the more important is that, you know, that's where the money is really going in there. Right. A uh, great question. Uh, I would say the answer is affirmative and I'll give you a simple analogy. In the past, we had the crown jewels, which were essentially the, the different elements uh, of uh, the that were carrying the critical information of an operator within the castle. So they were pretty much within the perimeter. The perimeter was protected by a moat, which is in the form of firewalls and whatnot. Right. So you've got everything beyond behind the perimeter, which made it very easy for or the CSPs to protect their critical infrastructure. Come 5G, the first change that has happened is the network has become software defined. Cloud has taken over. Most of these, with uh, the, uh, the service-based architecture coming to the picture, with edge coming into the picture, the crown jewels have actually crossed the moat and have actually started going to the customer premise. So talk about edge. We're talking about keeping some of the functions in the edge, which means the, the most in, uh, critical data will actually move to the edge. That's where securing this data and having a holistic security measures. And then we've actually got the new concept of mid hall coming in. We used to have front hall and back hall in the past when we were talking about the 4G regime. But now come 5G, we've got the mid hall that's uh, that's actually coming in. And then you've actually got different layers that you got to secure when it is 5G compared to what the situation was in case of 4G. So all these new developments the cloudification, the IoT, emergence of age, and then uh, the, these these high speeds, and also use of uh, this uh, 5G for uh, critical uh, activities, for mm -hmm. example, critical activities which impact the life of human. We all read in security that the human life is the most important aspect. Now, with the advent of 5G, uh, human lives are going to be affected. Just imagine uh, a surgery happening, and then the the, the the information uh, infrastructure is getting hacked. So you've actually got a big problem there. So that's where you are actually talking about the security and slicing is another aspect which is really driving security to the fore. Very much so. It's a great segue to our next session because we're looking at industrial control systems. Um, we did have you on for 5G. You mentioned sort of that link back to cybersecurity and how it's going to start to impact us. Uh, so it's definitely one to watch. Um, Srini, uh, I'll put you backstage if you don't mind. Thank you so much. That's uh, Srinivas Batraprolu, uh, who is the, let me bring up your proper title. I think I even put it in wrong. Uh, I think I've doubled up there. Uh, Head of Advanced Consulting Service with Nokia Sofia, Software. Uh, you are in Singapore, aren't you? I am, I am. Ah, indeed. good. Uh, but you're still a proud Indian, which is good to know, obviously, as well. If you had me confused there, I'm like, oh, hang on. <laughs> um, but very good. Thank you so much for that. And uh, if you can stay on, because I think we're going to hear from Daniel Ironreich and talk about ICS security. And it does cover o over sort of what you were just saying with 5G, IoT. And I think we might get, get you on at the end there uh, for a more open discussion about the impacts uh, and where you see um, the session. So, Daniel, I'm going to bring you on. Uh, thank you, Srini. Appreciate your time. And we'll have a chat to you before we go. Thank you. Mr. Daniel Ironreich, hang on, mate, uh, before you say hello. There you are. No, here I go. Daniel Ironreich, Secure Communications and Control Experts. How are you? Thank you very much for joining us. Okay. Good afternoon uh, to the audience in Australia. It's always a pleasure to come back. Uh, I was personally last year, but this time we are going to connect uh, through uh, through the internet. Uh, we will be <laughs> Discussing today, we'll be discussing today about industrial control system cybersecurity. Although I want to remind that last week we had a severe cyber attack on an insurance company in Israel. It was a ransomware attack. I couldn't help them, so I am continue with my topic of industrial cybersecurity. Beautiful. Thanks, Daniel. And um, so what we're going to do, we're going to I'm going to hand over to you uh, and get you to run through some slides. The idea is just to look at some of the so the key cybersecurity incidents that have occurred, I think, I don't know how far back you go, but certainly over the last 10 or so years, and then uh, we might walk through some of the ones that we've seen this year. And as you mentioned, 
ransomware attack on an Israeli insurance company just last week. Uh, so you might have some insights there. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go off screen and I'll still monitor the chat. So if there's anyone listening that want to get on a conversation with Daniel or reach out to him, and something else we're going to do is with Daniel, we had Daniel here in Australia, was it last year? Was it the year before? Yeah, that's it was last like, year. Yeah. It sounds like a long time ago, but 2019, we had him in Perth and Sydney with a bunch of critical infrastructure operators uh, looking at ICS cybersecurity, and we did a two-day workshop uh, here in Perth and in Sydney. So we're going to run a four-series episode uh, just exclusive to Daniel, so you need to register. It will be charged uh, given his experience, but uh, if that's of interest, uh, reach out to us here at uh, My Security Media. So I'm going to hand over to Daniel. Um, I'll stay on the line, I think, in audio mode. Uh, but if I've got a question or there's some chats, I'll, I'll come in and interrupt you, mate. But otherwise, uh, I'm going to hand over to your screen and get rid of my... Okay. Okay, perfect. So let's start me briefly with a couple of slides. Then obviously, Chris, feel free asking any question. That's the that's the purpose of this uh, discussion. Before we dive into actual cyber attacks on industrial control system, very important to remind all of us that Practically, there are three main vectors how a infrastructure or any kind of computer system can be attacked. It, it starts with the internally generated cyber attack when somebody is penetrating to the facility. And we all remember the famous one, uh, I will list uh, soon some of them, but the famous, the Stuxnet. Then we speak about the externally generated, Sorry, if we speak about the externally generated cyber attack where the most famous one was Ukraine 2015-2016. And finally, we need to start to think about supply chain related cyber attack, although we at this moment, luckily, we didn't see major examples. So these are the three main vectors when you worry about cybersecurity. This is what you this is what you need what you need to worry about. Uh, I would like to I would like to make a, a small summary about and about the attackers. So there are a couple of types of attackers that this is very important to understand who are the attackers. So first of all, we have a very simple attacker who just want to attack and run away without causing any damage, just perhaps to say, I was the one who did it, low resources, low motivation. The higher level is the one who is interested to steal information 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 again this is not a very strong cyber attack but why we are stealing why they are stealing information from industrial control system for main reason these are not credit cards just in order to be able to prepare a, a larger a cyber attack then we are talking about the outage and financial losses. This was the Ukraine case. Uh, this already required some uh, significant resources and motiv motivation, but the purpose is not to cause damage, just to cause an outage, and uh, this is uh, enough. Then we, then we have the next one, which was the Stuxnet, and the main reason was actually uh, cause damage to machinery, damage to operation equipment, and they uh, stop the organization operating the, the Iranian uh, Atas, uh, nuclear facility. Then finally, the highest uh, risk is when there is a risk to lives of people. We all remember that the, the the attempt to attack the Saudi Arabia Aramco, the safety instrument system, and uh, luckily nothing happened there. Attacker made some uh, small mistakes and nothing happened. But this, but if you want to understand the motivation of the attacker, you need to look at that list. Let's look about the famous attacks on industrial control systems. Although I must say that not all of all of these lists are directly to industrial system, just few of them. The Moruchi water in Australia, then in 1998 was the famous one. This is where it started. Then obviously the Stuxnet in 2010. The target stores in USA was attack. A 
on a on a store, but it was done through a air condition service provider. So we consider it some kind of a, a relation to industrial operation. The Ukrainian was a direct attack, wanna cry. Uh, I just go through the list, uh, uh, activation of sirens. And finally, uh, earlier this year, we had the attack in Israel on a small water utility. And I will talk about it in details later. When we speak about the organization architecture, uh, we need to look at this picture which shows that in the lower three layers we have the industrial system about that what we had a, what used to be an air gap and then we have the it operation we all know that air gap no longer exists and there is some there is a connection between the it and the ics but very important to say that attackers may penetrate uh, and start the attack at any of these layers and the, finally, the, always the goal is to reach to the lowest level, the shop floor, where damage or outage can be done. So if we speak about in more details about a few of about few of the attacks, the Maruchi Shire uh, sewage spill we, in 1998, 1999, we all remember that it was a contractor who was fired and the result was one million liter of untreated sewage was released in 26 occasions. I must say at that time we, we didn't we didn't know how to say the word cyber attack. So it was a sort of interruption to the lives of people people then we have the stuxnet i already mentioned in 2010 it was a it was a external internally generated a cyber attack and the main goal was to cause damage to the facility damage to the nuclear uh, operator operation the machinery then obviously we have the ukraine in 2015 2016 uh, the, the goal of the system was to cause operation outage it it was done through the it system so it's the externally generated attack how it happened it started with some type of social engineering where one of the employees uh, opened an excel file which was attached to the which was attached to the one of the emails the the malware came in and obviously uh, it was installed uh, uh, on the system actually i must say it was a dual attack it was a dual attack on once a uh, once they cause operation outages outage to 800,000 people for a period of six hours and the, the power was restored manually by people who went out to the substation and did it but at the same time it was a distributed denial of service type attack on the call center so it was a strange situation that operators were sitting in the room they saw that the demand for electric power is gradually dropping but no one is calling no one is complaining it took them some time to realize that something is wrong they sent out people and the the problem was uh, it was uh, corrected it took a couple as i said six hours the next one I want to speak about details before we are going to the to the famous story in Israel was that uh, Trinton in Saudi Arabia, a uh, Aramco in 2017. It was also an externally generated attack, but this was a very severe attack. Why? Because the intention of the attacker was to disable the safety instrumented system. What does it mean if you disable the safety instrument system? It means that if some, if an unusual or a severe situation will happen and you rely on the safety instrument system to stop the attack and make sure that explosion will not happen, if this system is disabled, then 
obviously a explosion can happen and people might get might get hurt as i mentioned earlier we are lucky that not no major harm happened uh, i would like to talk in more details about uh, about what happened in israel there was a couple of the, it was published you can find many a lot of information uh, uh, on the internet it was an externally generated attack according to publication it was done by iranian iranians who penetrated to that water utility but let's let you know everybody's speaking israel is a cyber uh, nation so how it could happen why it happened we all know that during the covid 19 period all organization are more relying on external maintenance meaning that you cannot have a very very strong cyber security because you must allow remotely connected employees remotely connecting subcontractors so so the systems are less protected and obviously it happened in april uh, earlier this year the covid 19 was just in the beginning and the organizations didn't have enough time to prepare stronger uh, defense so what happened here is the attacker penetrated to the scala system and what he saw he saw the SCADA screens, all SCADA screens explained in Hebrew. So we don't know if, it, if the attacker could read it, but anyway, according to publication, they, they used Google Translation in order to, in order to translate uh, the SCADA screen and understand how the SCADA steam is system is operating. Obviously, this is one of the standard SCADA systems, so people know they uh, know it. And they initially uh, they they started to do smaller manipulation, and then later they went to more severe manipulation so i would like to talk a little bit in more detail so remember externally generated cyber attack on water utility which was not strongly protected so how it happened uh, the attacker originally targeted two sites by compromising the scada the scada system Obviously, they they hide themselves uh, through different ser uh, servers in North America and Europe, so it was uh, it was uh, difficult to to trace them. It's not very clear why the attacker was not successful. I want to say it very clearly. So uh, they had a couple of targets. Initially, they started to 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 start to to play with the pumps shut it down start operating shut it down start operating and this could create water waves and water waves are very dangerous because they can create a rupture on the water fine water pipes but more important more critical that they had the intention to manipulate the plc's which are controlling the the chemicals added into the into the water so the goal was create some kind of a poisoning to the to the water and obviously harm people so at the moment we are speaking about harming people you know immediately it is it is uh, rated to the highest level of attacker who has resources who has motivation and probably financed by hostile country I would like to 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 show this uh, picture which is the which is a very famous picture and showing how a small attack can develop to a larger attack a more severe attack so in the bottom in the in the green color you see the normal operation uh, then you then about it you see the operation which is still normal but out of range and then 
you see the operation when, a, when we already a safety instrument system, the third one from the bottom, actually in the middle, the safety instrument system is aimed to stop the operation. So, but uh, in a highly critical system, uh, if the safe, safety instrument system is not operating properly, there are there must be some higher and higher level of protections. And if nothing is, or if it's not installed, or if it's not not operating, obviously explosion or a huge damage can happen. So when you think about critical infrastructure, you look at this picture. Uh, on the last slide, I would like to show a, a structure of how we are analyzing a cyber attack on industrial control system. So in the center, in the in the gray uh, cloud, you can see the tools which, which you can use, the Lockheed Martin Cyber Kill Chain, the Mitre ATT CK uh, analysis, or you can use an expert team or a sporadic internal process, all of them are possible. Now, let's look at this picture, which is an excellent guidance for those who are protecting critical infrastructure. If you go uh, one step or to the left, you see, uh, you see what we discussed earlier, the four layers of attackers. The security level as defined by ISA 62443. The security level one is the lowest uh, and the, the attacker with the least resources, knowledge and motivation. And in the bottom, you see the highest level, the state level attacker who has resources, motivation and so on. If you... If you go uh, move a step uh, to the left side, you you can see what kind of assets can be attacked. And why this is important? Because when you are dealing with ICS cybersecurity, you need to know your facility. You need to know what is installed. You need to know what is critical. So initially it is just an important, but in the bottom you can see the crown jewel or the highest risk, uh, highest risk uh, uh, zone or a, a machine which can be attacked. So this is on the left side. If you go further to the right side, you can see what is the impact, what can happen. So on the top, you see the operation outage, which is severe, but it's not very, not a huge problem. Then you can go down to data exposure, mechanical damage, uh, what happened in, in is the Stuxnet and hurting people, what might happen in uh, Saudi Arabia. So think about this slide and you can use this slide to analyze your own facility and learn it. Before we go to the questions and the more detailed discussions, I would like to just say a few words, put security, the takeaways, what you learn from this very short session, put security and safety goals into your specification. Very important, deal only with vendors who take safety and cybersecurity seriously. Do not compromise if there are requirements, you make sure you that the solution that you are buying will uh, work. And then finally, what else you can do? Be always ready for tomorrow challenges and surprises. So this is shortly what I want to say. Chris, if you have any question or the audience any questions, let's discuss it during the time. Beautiful. Thank you, Daniel. And I'm going to bring Srini in as well. Oh, there goes my uh, that cool title. Um, look, thank you, Daniel. Srini, welcome uh, commentary from you. But really, uh, the, the reason I like Daniel, because of not only just his Israeli accent gives a whole sense of uh, sort of urgency and importance to, to some of these attacks, but some of them are involving Israel uh, in conflict as well. Nation states starting to sort of touch each other in terms of their critical infrastructure, and it's really what uh, we're talking about here in terms of the importance um, of this particular topic. Um, the attack vectors and the, the attack methodology, um, as Daniel points out, can be quite complex, uh, takes time, uh, patience, but also, you know, you really need to know what, you, what you're talking about. 
do you anticipate we're going to see an increase of these uh, or do you think um, these might be more related to uh, legacy operational technology uh, and it should be designed out in new plants and new critical technology coming through? Where, where do you sort of see this going, given the history uh, of some of these attacks? Um, in fact, I fully agree with Daniel. I like his last statement, uh, which is basically take security very seriously and be prepared for something that's going to happen eventually tomorrow. It's all about if, it's, uh, it's, it's all about when, not if. That's what it is, right? And that's why everybody, and I like this statement, uh, and I think I it can pretty much summarize Daniel's thought process that security is not a margin anymore. It's into mainstream. That's what we got to be uh, cognizant of. I think uh, very clearly Daniel has outlined some of the threat vectors and the threat vectors are going to get a lot more complex. And I'll tell you the reason. Uh, obviously, we are all uh, using advanced technologies, the artificial intelligence and the machine learning uh, to actually remediate quite a few threat vectors that are coming our way. But uh, tell you what, the attackers, the hacktivists are actually having the same set of tools at, the, at their disposal. So I think the attack vectors are going to get a lot more complex. And also, if you look at the, uh, the surface, the surface that is actually going to be there for exposure, earlier it was a lot limited. We talked about the analogy of uh, crown jewels and Daniel talked about it as well. So the crown jewels were pretty much in the castle along with the queen being protected by the moat. But now that is not the case anymore. The, the surface of exposure has actually gro uh, gone, uh, gone very wide. That means the threat vectors will go up. Come 5G, the biggest impact that it is going to make is on industry 4.0. That's going to come to the fore. Now when industry 4.0 comes in, when 5G makes it its entry into the industrial controls, 5G makes its control in, uh, entry into public, trans, public transport, public safety and whatnot. I think the threat vectors are going to get a lot more complex and then the, the remediation measures have to be a lot more, uh, I would say, sophisticated. But more than remediation measures, I would say the proactive measures to actually prevent these threats. That's what every uh, cybersecurity strategy report talks about, proactively preventing these threats on a consistent basis continually, which means again and again and again, is one of the most important aspects that is actually uh, being confronted by every organization today. Daniel, um, you talked about machine learning. That type of attack that we saw this year on the Israeli water system, you said they were trying to create waves uh, through the control of the PLCs. Is that something that you would anticipate into the future that a plant will understand what is normal and sort of start to use machine learning or you know, artificial intelligence, for want of a better word, to really understand and, and, and create that sort of differentiation between what is operational technology, what's the IT environment, and making sure that if they do touch uh, they can sort of pick up what might be an attack, a bit like how they use uh, sort of machine learning to pick up early signs of malware. Defin definitely, yes. Uh, the intrusion detection systems, which are deployed uh, gradually in many of the industrial control systems, are using anomaly behavior detection. So, so finding out not if there is an attack, if there is something strange, something that yeah. we didn't see yesterday. Furthermore, we gradually installing what we call Purdue Level Zero monitoring, having a separate PLC, which is not connected to the main control network, having a separate PLC monitoring a separate set of sensors independently from the SCADA system and again finding out if there is something unusual. If that PLC is detecting uh, something unusual, alert can go directly to the security room and the action can be taken even if the SCADA system was manipulated and showing a different picture. That's what happened in a in, uh, in the stacks that the the machinery was attacked but the SCADA system showed normal operation so gradually we are overcoming this uh, this risk very good look i'm trying to find uh, we'll have it in the show notes but we had um the israeli cyber directorate uh head and also i mentioned toby toby Fikum earlier uh in a webinar session between australia and israel 
Uh, I think on the 1st of July we held it. Uh, we will have that in the show notes, looking at uh, the Israeli cybersecurity sort of structure and strategy uh, and how that fitted in with Australia as well. And uh, we've certainly covered that today. Uh, I think we've rattled off half a dozen countries that we've been able to talk about in cybersecurity. And I think, Daniel, you brought it together very nicely in terms of the style of attacks that are occurring and the importance uh, of that OT, IT security. Uh, and I don't know whether it was since we had you here in Australia, whether we did up, uptake the discussion, but since uh, that time last year, there's been a lot more discussion on that IT, OT uh, environment. And I think it is related back to, as to we t- uh, touched with uh, Srini on the uh, five sort of 5G, IoT sort of wave that we're about to, to see over this, this next decade. So look, on that note, I don't think we've got any questions from the audience. Uh, for those that want to touch uh, base with Daniel, uh, please do so. And we're going to be doing a four episode series with Daniel. Uh, it'll be registration only, uh, but it'll be a very high level OTIT sort of walkthrough. And uh, and yeah, so well, I think we'll be starting that around sort of late January, uh, early February. But if you can get in early, getting before the end of the year, uh, we'll make sure you get a, a good sort of discount off that uh, nice and early. Um, Chris, go Srini. Yeah, uh, I just would like to clarify on one point. You actually posed a question to me that how much is Singapore spending? Uh, so uh, the, yes, number that, the number <laughs> that uh, the 200 that I've actually given to you is US dollars per year. So God, I was going to say, week, what did... Yeah, it did next... sound low when you said it was like 200 million a year. That's not a lot of money. Yeah, oh, no, yeah. it was 200 million over five years or something. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 200 million US dollars, which is close to 300 million Singapore dollars. So what they intend to spend in the next three years is close to a billion Singapore dollars. Got it. Which yeah. is pretty much in line with what Australia is spending, which is 1.67 <laughs> billion for the for no. next 10 years, right? I think they must be. Uh, it's the billion dollar spend now. If they're not spending a billion dollars or more. Uh, then they're not in the race. So, uh, but thank you for clarifying that. I did. Uh, I did pick up that when you said that. I was like, okay. Um, look, thank you so much. Good to see you again, Daniel. Uh, you're looking very fit and healthy in there. And I hope Israel, uh, you're going through. I think I heard on our local news here, you might be in your third wave. So, stay indoors uh, and stay safe. Uh, and the vaccine's coming soon, mate. So just okay, I perfect. I think it's because it's your winter there, isn't it? Uh, the, the winter in Israel is not something seriously to worry about. <laughs> not from an Australian perspective anyway. Um, but look, thank you. Let me bring up your, your names here. We've been joined by Daniel Ironreich, uh, the sort of lead principal consultant for secure communications and control experts. And I proudly have a, a certificate from Daniel on his two-day workshop. Uh, and then we were also joined, I just fixed your, oh, it's disappeared. The, oh, now there it is. Uh, and then we were joined by Srinivas Prachaprolu, the Head of Advanced Consulting Service with Nokia Software in Singapore. Uh, Srini and Daniel, thank you so much. Uh, do appreciate your time. I'm just going to close off uh, with our report of the week uh, and then we'll close off. This edited, recorded version will be available on MySec TV and our YouTube channel. So thank you. Shalom, Daniel. Uh, we'll talk again soon, mate. All the best. Uh, we'll have thank some you. of your articles out. Uh, and Srini, thank you very much for your time. Good to have you on again. Thank you very much, Chris. Pleasure. Good All the best. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Okay, just some latest. I've got one more slide uh, before we go as we are trying to make a regular thing, uh, and it's the report of the week. This literally came out today um, from McAfee. I haven't read it in detail, but... Um, we do tend to cover these global reports from McAfee, and I, it really had because it had that trillion dollars there uh, of what McAfee is now claiming is the cost of cybercrime uh, to the world economy. I reckon it's ticked over the trillion dollar mark, uh, or more than one percent of global GDP, uh, which is up more than fifty percent from a two thousand and eighteen study that put the global losses at close to six hundred billion dollars. I know there's always a bit of conjecture on how much this is uh, sort of costing, where they're getting the figures from, but uh, a trillion dollars there. I think McAfee came out with this a while ago as well in terms of the the cost. But either way, it's a good headline, report of the week, check it out, uh, and uh, it'll be in tomorrow's newsletter. Look, thank you so much again. Um, It's been 
a good session. We've just gone on the hour. Thank you very much for joining us on Tech and Sec Weekly. We'll be back tomorrow with the Malaysian uh, CEO for Cybersecurity Malaysia and HGC. Uh, and then stay tuned for Thursday's Blackout Series with Shemaine Tan as well on the Cyber Risk Meetup. Thank you very much.